Now, if you're in a windy situation, if you're in a situation with vibration, of course you should experiment. And there's lots of reasons why that's a good place to go and experiment and see if image stabilization happens to help you or not. Um, let's now go to the next menu, which is the tools menu. And I'm going to go down to an important part of this, which is the uh, power saving side. So I'm going to click in on power saving, auto power down. Because it takes time to set up the Gigapan robot and camera and decide what your f frame is going to be, it's really frustrating to be doing that whole thing and then have the camera turn itself off in the middle. So we recommend turning off auto power down. By the same token, display off is something you want to not have happen for as long as possible. Go for the maximum. Keep that camera on and operating properly. Warning, in some of these cameras, um, including this one, if the display turns itself off, you will often lose things like auto exposure lock and autofocus lock. Um, actually, correction, the G11 doesn't do that, but I'm quite sure that the SD780 does that. So you really want to make that number large, if possible. That's power saving, and that's the other really important aspect that I wanted you to see. That's it. So now we can go out of the menu. And let me talk a little bit about how I typically set up my whole system for gigapanning on an Epic or an Epic 100 base. So what I'll do is set up my tripod, of course, and this is heavy, so you're going to put it on a nice sturdy tripod, not, not a $18 tripod, but uh, something a little more expensive than that. And you set your system up, or you put it on a tabletop. Before I turn the Gigapan Epic or Epic 100 on, because I can move this by hand relatively easily, I'll actually go through and set up the camera. And I want to go through that process with you for a really unusual Gigapan. We're going to take a Gigapan of some historical Gigapan units that are behind me on the shelf. So what I do at this point is I'll set up the shot first by zooming in all the way, making sure I understand the level of resolution I'm going to be at. And then I'll go in and actually start to adjust the things that matter in a day-to-day -day sense. Now I've put the display mode in such a setting that I actually see everything. And an important point to make to you is, uh, if we look at the top of the camera, it's in M, or manual mode. That's very important. We need as much consistency between the shots as possible. So we want the same exposure. We want certainly the same white balance. Otherwise, we'll get different color temperatures, and as we knit, knit these together, it'll look very odd. So I typically put that in manual mode. I'll typically put the ISO on the finest level of detail possible. These small point-and-shoots have relatively small image sensors, and so a low ISO is particularly meaningful. Um, as we talk about pro units, you can, of course, use much higher ISO values, and that's just fine. Uh, but on these cameras and the signal-to-noise ratios they have, you really want to go for 80 or 100 if you can. I'm going to leave it on, on 100 right now. When I'm outside, I always use 80 without fail. So we're in manual mode. We've got ISO of 100. That's two of the settings that you're making. Now let's go and look at the settings on screen. I'm going to go ahead and hit the middle of the little donut here called Function Set and walk down. We don't want Auto White Balance. And you can see Auto White Balance showing here. Instead of Auto White Balance, what we want to do is pick a specific white balance that we're going to use across the entire panorama. In this case, it's a cloudy day. There's also some fluorescent lighting in here, so let me see which looks better. That's way too blue, so we'll go with Cloudy Day. There we go. So we've chosen our white balance setting. Now let's go down the rest of this menu. This has a neutral density filter, which is essentially like sunglasses for the camera. We don't want that because I want to get in as much light as possible. Um, what does matter here, I want to take single shots. Every time I have the robot press the button, I want a, a single picture to get taken. That's fine. And I want large. In other words, I want the highest resolution, super fine setting possible. And Typically, with any camera you're using, you're going to go for the largest and most super fine version of resolution that's available on the camera. That's really important. Um, in general, we recommend you go ahead and use JPEG mode. So if your camera supports RAW and JPEG, go ahead and use JPEG, unless you need to make significant post-processing modifications to the images before you upload them to the stitcher, in which case you could go to RAW, do all sorts of work because you've contained as much information as possible and then save as JPEG and send to the Stitcher. The Stitcher also supports 16-bit TIFF, so you can do 8 16-bit TIFF, you can do 8-bit JPEG. Okay, so that's the image size. That's it for the left side of the display. Now, on the right side of the display, it's important to note the flash is off. You don't want your flash on. Um, for obvious reasons, we're taking hundreds of pictures, we'll use up the battery. We're in manual mode, which is exactly what we want, because that allows us to adjust the 
shutter speed, and the iris. Now, let's talk a little bit about the iris and about the shutter speed. On this camera, when you're zoomed in all the way, f4.5 is as small as it gets, as the f-stop gets. And that means that the aperture can only be so wide. Um, not very wide, in fact. And in this situation that's pretty dark, I'd be going for as big as it gets, and then I'd be adjusting the shutter. But let's talk about iris a little bit. There are some interesting problems you get into. With all of these digital cameras, as you make the iris really small, that means when you make the f-stop really large, you get into a diffraction problem. And with gigapans, you really care about the, how crystal clear that image is. As your iris gets really small and you get diffraction, it gets softer. It gets blurrier, actually. So this is something you should experiment with. On the G11, for example, I try very hard to never go beyond about f5.6 because you really start having significant diffraction problems. And I stay as big as I can. But there's a trade-off, right? Because if your iris is large, then you have very shallow depth of field. So especially if things are close like this and you're zoomed in all the way, it's very difficult to get everything in focus at the same time. So my preference, if nothing's moving, is keep that iris large, make the shutter speed nice and long if I have to. Now let's talk about what happens at night. Because sometimes you're going to want to do that. And it's nighttime, and you want a big iris, and no matter what you do, you have a two or three second exposure. So how do you do that? Well, you'll do the two or three second exposure, but in a situation like that, I'll do something else. I'll actually introduce a two second timer. Now this is nice, because if you have a two second timer, then you can have a nice long exposure, and when you press the button on the camera, it waits two seconds and then takes a picture. By the time it takes a picture, there's no vibration, there's nothing moving. And so that two-second timer gives you the chance of everything being still. And in nighttime photography or museum photography, I find that two-second exposure especially useful. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn off the two-second exposure so that it takes pictures instantly for now. And so now what we've got is 1 20th of a second f4.5 in this relatively dark situation. Now once you've identified all of those settings, there's one other setting you have to be aware of, which is the focus. We talked about this a little bit before. If you're in a scene where everything's at the same distance, go to manual focus, nail the focus, and be done. Or infinity, if you're in the Grand Canyon situation. In a situation where things are truly at different focuses, you can try leaving autofocus on and see how it does. Although you may find that when you get to things like the clouds in the sky, it does poorly. You could pause it during the gigapan, during the panorama acquisition. You can pause it, go back, and change the focus setting. So you can be in manual and go to infinity at that point, or you can be in autofocus and switch to manual and go to infinity, and then you can resume taking the panorama on the blue sky that way. So that's an idea for dealing with the fact that some places should be autofocus, and some places you want to lock the focus because they don't have enough contrast, enough detail for focusing to work well. That describes everything we need to know about taking the pictures with the camera. One of the important next steps is actually trying it out. So I'll take a picture, then once I've taken the picture, I'll go and look at it. So I'm going to go to the mode where you're looking at the pictures. I'll zoom in, look at it in gory detail, and wow, I've got a nice picture. I'm able to see the little buttons on the old-fashioned gigapan unit quite well. I'm seeing little chinks in the aluminum. So I'll zoom out. So now I know that the pictures the camera takes are, are reasonable. In this case, it's autofocus, and the autofocus is doing a good job at that distance, which is not surprising. Great. So I'm happy with the quality of the picture, and I've set up my camera. That covers everything that I go through with the camera to make sure it's prepared and ready for the panorama acquisition, in this case, of my bookshelf. Now we turn our attention to the robot. So now let's look at the menus that the Epic 100 has, which are largely similar to the ones that the, that the Epic has. When you turn it on, you have the new panorama menu. And uh, I'm going to grab the pen. You already know what New Panorama does. It allows you to set the top, left, bottom, right corners and take your panorama. The next menu to show you is 360 Panorama. That's a nice selection where you know you want to get pictures all the way around. When you choose this menu, it simply has you choose the top edge and the bottom edge of the panorama using the top and bottom keys, and then it takes all the pictures around. We'll go into the next menu, Last Panorama. Last Panorama is really interesting, and there's some nice special effects you could do with it. Last panorama takes the boundaries of the previous panorama you just took, goes to the top left corner, and lets you take it again. You can actually use the right, left, up, down keys to move the robot to any cell in the panorama and then start there and start taking pictures. So you can be surgical. You can take a panorama, let's say, 
of the bush in South Africa on a safari. Then you can wait for a giraffe to show up. You can click last panorama and then use these to manually move the camera until you have the giraffe in the center of a frame and you're snapped to the grid, so you're in the panorama grid. And then you can press the button by hand or with the robot trigger and get that giraffe. And then on the stitcher side, you can drop that picture in by replacing the picture of that part of the bush with the picture with the giraffe in it. Now you have a picture with the giraffe. So last panorama is really quite effective for fast forwarding, going to a particular place, and surgically modifying pictures for yourself. Options, we're going to go ahead and enter that and look at some very important options. First one, time per picture. This is a big deal. The robot doesn't know directly when the camera is done taking a picture. And so the robot needs to be told by you how many seconds to wait between pictures. Now my default when I'm outside is three seconds. Three seconds is enough time that I can take a hundred picture panorama and it doesn't take forever, right? It's only a couple of three minutes. And three seconds is usually enough time where outside, if the exposure is really fast on the camera, you're going to be all right. You're going to have enough time for the camera to do its thing. However, that's not the case for indoor photography and especially for dark photography. Let's say you're in a situation in a museum or a dark night, night scene where, in fact, the camera is spending, let's say, one and a half seconds exposure. Well, if you set that thing to one and a half seconds exposure, especially on some of these cameras, once you get above one or two seconds exposure, they'll do a one second or two second exposure. Then they'll close the shutter for two seconds, do another exposure to get a measurement of the black noise. And they'll compare those to create the best picture they can. So suddenly your two second exposure is taking four seconds. And then it has to write the picture to the SD card. So you take four seconds plus something. So now the shutter delay needs to go from three seconds, which gives you just enough time to move and be ready and finish review mode and get ready to shoot again, all the way to something like eight or nine seconds. So don't be shy about making this number large. One of the worst things that can happen to you is you're in an excellent shot situation. You set this to some number that's borderline. It's just barely working. And it's working. And you get to a picture that happens to have a lot of detail in it. So the JPEG compression doesn't compress it as much. So it takes a little longer to write to the SD card than your other pictures. So the camera's not quite ready. And so in this nice picture that you're capturing most of, you end up going home and realize that in this 200 picture panorama, there's these two very detailed pictures. You're just missing the picture after them because the picture after them never got taken. So that's a reason to make sure you're not in a boundary case with that number. Below time per picture, the next menu is battery status. That's a nice menu. Uh, it's indicating that we're at 7.3 volts right now, which is a pretty good value to be at with the batteries. Anything above 7 volts tells me that the batteries are in reasonable shape. And we'll go down again. Start delay. Start delay is really useful if you want to be in the picture. Or if you are in a situation where, for instance, you're putting your gigapan unit and camera on a hot air balloon and setting it up in the sky. Not that I've done that myself, but you can imagine doing that. So start delay allows you to go in and say, when I say start the panorama, don't start for 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and you can keep going up to 10, 15 minutes. So you can essentially delay the entire panorama acquisition to whatever you like. That's start delay.